I feel like a crazy person sometimes, you know? There are so many incredible, underappreciated series out there, yet all anyone wants to talk about is whether or not Tanjiro wants to marry his sister. Demon Slayer is a masterpiece. The glory of Shonen's newest masterpiece. Demon Slayer just set a new standard. Has it? Has it really? What has Demon Slayer done to earn such praise? Because from my perspective, all I see is a derivative, uninspired, and incompetent manga that manages to fail at the most basic standards of writing. I know right away that some people think I'm just trying to be a contrarian, or that I'm dunking on Demon Slayer because it's easy to hate popular things. But that isn't the case. I don't go into any new series wanting to dislike it. I don't want to waste my time on something that I won't enjoy. But after reading Demon Slayer, I just felt genuinely confused about what exactly people enjoy about this series. And then I saw the anime. There it is. Pretty animation go burr. Look, I like good animation as much as the next guy. Probably more, actually. I could make a whole video about why I love animators and think they're insane. But good animation is only worth so much if the story that it's attached to isn't of the same quality. Incredible fights don't hit as hard if there's no narrative weight behind them. Well-directed character moments don't make you feel anything if the buildup to that point is non-existent. So yes. I need you to forget the flashy animation for a moment, because today we're talking about the writing behind Demon Slayer and the many ways that it simply doesn't work. And yes, there will be Demon Slayer spoilers ahead. Disclaimer! Throughout this video, I mistakenly refer to the author of Demon Slayer by masculine pronouns, only to find out during editing that they prefer gender neutral pronouns. I am very sorry about that. That was my mistake. I will be more careful in the future. Demon Slayer is a shonen manga created by Goyoharu Gotoge, which was first serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump. To say that Demon Slayer was Gotoge's first big success would be an understatement. In fact, it's been so successful that Gotoge was included in the Times 100 Most Influential People list, the first mangaka to receive such an honor. You know who didn't receive that award? The late Kentaro Miura, the brilliant author of Berserk, which has been a massive inspiration for other manga creators and artists the world over. Ichiro Oda, the author of One Piece, a manga that has eclipsed Batman in comic sales. Akira Toriyama! I don't even like Dragon Ball and I think that's bullshit! Demon Slayer is set sometime in Japan's Taisho era and follows the story of Tanjiro Kamado. Tanjiro is just a normal kid from a small remote village. Very normal. Not special at all. He cares deeply for his large family, but chapter one plot twist. They're all dead. Killed overnight while Tanjiro was away. No killer in sight. Tanjiro acts fast, realizing that his sister Nezuko may still be alive. Can't have the primary love interest die too quickly now. He rushes to get her to a doctor, but chapter one plot twist. <laughs> She's a demon. In the world of Demon Slayer, demons are monsters with superhuman strength and abilities that feed on humans in order to grow stronger. Demons can regenerate almost any damage they take, but they die in the sunlight so they can only hunt at night. They're a lot like Reddit mods in our world. The only way for Nezuko to have become a demon would be if Tanjiro's family was attacked by a demon. But that's not important right now. What matters is that Nezuko is a demon. Meaning just like a woman from Alabama, she wants a piece of her brother. Tanjiro fends her off and tries to plead with her until a man with a sword tries to kill Nezuko in order to protect Tanjiro. This man is a demon slayer. What's that, you might be asking? Oh god, I hope you aren't asking. Hey man, did you beat Max Payne yet? Uh, no, I've been playing. Demon slayer. Demon slayer. What are you doing that? Your mom! Demon Slayers slay demons.
Funny Swordman is here to kill Nezuko, but not before having a lengthy conversation with Tanjiro about how he's a beta male that can't protect his sister. This leads to Tanjiro attacking the man and impressing him with his natural affinity for combat before ultimately getting knocked out. Nezuko escapes the man's grasp, but chapter one plot twist, she protects Tanjiro instead of trying to attack him. Stunned by this turn of events, the man knocks Nezuko out instead of killing her. He realized that Nezuko and Tanjiro are built different, given that Nezuko shouldn't be able to resist her urge to eat humans. When they wake up, he directs Tanjiro to go meet an old man living in the mountains. This is a Rokodaki. He's a man that trains people to become demon slayers. Tanjiro is going to become a demon slayer in order to search for a way to make Nezuko human again. So it is okay to kill demons, but only the demons that aren't his sister. There's zero chance that any other demon is morally ambiguous. No, this will not be a plot point. You'll remember that demons have regenerative abilities, so they can't be killed by normal means. The only way to kill a demon is to expose them to sunlight or to cut off their head with a special kind of sword. What makes this sword special and why can it kill demons? Well, these swords are made from metal mined out of a volcano, which has the power of the sun contained in the earth and I'm just fucking with you, there's no reason. It's never gonna be explained, so just don't question it. Urokodaki teaches Tanjiro the basics of swordsmanship and then tells him he has to cut a big rock if he wants a chance to take the test to become a demon slayer. Tanjiro struggles with how to approach this issue until he meets Urokodaki's other students, Sabito and Makomo. For the next six months, they train Tanjiro in Urokodaki's stead. They teach Tanjiro about total concentration breathing, the main weapon a demon slayer utilizes. By breathing a certain way, demon slayers can give their blood and muscles extra air, allowing them to move faster and stronger. This breathing gives them strength analogous to the superhuman strength of a demon, but it's very taxing on the body, so it takes Tanjiro a while to learn it. About six months, in fact. After six months of training, Tanjiro and Sabito duel, and Tanjiro wins, only to find that he's managed to split the rock in half, meaning he's now ready to become a demon slayer. Before setting out, Tanjiro asks Orokodaki to thank Sabito and Makomo for their help. Orokodaki then questions how Tanjiro can know the names of his dead students. That's right, they were dead the entire time, killed in a plot relevancy accident 30 years ago. You may have noticed me reiterating that six month timeline kind of a lot. That's because I have a real fucking problem with this plot point. Tanjiro was living in Urokodaki's house this entire time. Do you really expect me to believe that over the course of six fucking months, it never came up a conversation that Tanjiro was training with Urokodaki's deceased students? It's absurdly convenient to say the least. Not to mention that their involvement in the story not only establishes that ghosts are real, but also that they can have a tangible effect on the world of the living. Sabito was even able to injure Tanjiro. I don't have a problem with the whole ghost thing because that's pretty consistent, but you will never again see one actually do anything besides talking to people that were important to them when they were alive. With that being said though, this is hardly the biggest problem with Demon Slayer. It's just one of many. Let's talk about that total concentration breathing from before since it's the primary power system in Demon Slayer. You would think from the description that there is only one special way of breathing to strengthen a Demon Slayer, but no. There are, in fact, many different ways to breathe. They're breathing, everybody. I just want to make that clear. Something that I've been doing is wearing my CPAP even when I'm not sleeping. <laughs> Sabito specifically taught Tanjiro one form of breathing, water breathing. This means that when he attacks, it appears as though water is rushing out of his sword. But don't be fooled. As far as I can tell, this is just visual flair for us as the audience to enjoy. In reality, he's just swinging his sword around. There's no actual water. Not that I would blame you for thinking otherwise, given that it is never explained or even alluded to. Even through conducting research for this video, I wasn't able to find a solid consensus on whether or not that's true. It's just my own interpretation at this point. Why give clear indicators of plot information when you can just not? Answering important questions is just so much work. There are other breathing styles such as flame breathing and thunder breathing which give off the appearance of their title. 
My main problem with breathing comes from a lack of differentiation. Now, I know at first that may not make any sense, given that each style is very visually distinct. But what I'm talking about is functionality. Functionally speaking, most of the breathing types are exactly the same. When you create different forms of the same ability, there needs to be strengths and weaknesses to each of them. Now, on the surface, this does exist. Thunder breathing is much faster than the other forms in a technical sense. But in reality, each style of breathing has the same or similar abilities to every other form, meaning they're all functionally the same. There's never a moment in this series where Tanjiro is at a disadvantage because he's a water breather. There's never a moment where two characters trade opponents in order to get a better matchup. It's completely meaningless flash with no substance. If you think I'm wrong, then tell me the difference between the following attacks. Sound breathing, fourth form. Water breathing, fourth form turbulent. And beast breathing, fifth bang. The answer is that there is no difference. They're each representative of multiple slashes in multiple directions, meaning that there is no real difference between them besides how they're presented visually. This is a common theme across every form. They all share attacks. Let's imagine that you made an MMO for a second. In your MMO, you made a bunch of different classes for people to choose from. Each of those classes fills a primary role, tank, healer, or damage. But even then, there are differences between classes filling the same role. You've got a damage class that's better for crowd control and one that's better for single target damage. One tank that's better at taking damage and one that absorbs damage well. These different strengths lead to different play styles. Demon Slayer is what would happen if every class functioned exactly the same. Why would you even waste time making different classes at that point? Every class is going to give the player the exact same experience, rendering the choice between which one to use meaningless. And by the way, can we talk about the blatant misogyny in this power system? There are so many different forms of breathing. There's stone breathing, wind breathing, mist breathing. But what do the female characters use? Insect breathing, flower breathing, love breathing. There is not a single living female demon slayer that does not use a feminine breathing style. So you want to be a demon slayer, eh kid? Well, you're gonna need to choose a breathing style. Although, since I see you've got a pair of fatty tissue sacks, these are your only actual options. But since it is Women's History Month, for limited time only, you can try having a job breathing. And all of this comes before we question how exactly breathing a certain way enables different abilities. It doesn't make any sense, and there's never an explanation for what the actual difference between each of them is. There are exceptions, such as Shinobu Kocho's insect breathing, which utilizes poison instead of actual blade attacks to take down enemies. Because she's too weak to decapitate demons. The girl is too weak to cut off a demon's head. Would it be so hard to make each style this distinct? Am I asking too much? Actually, I don't think I'm asking enough. Let's talk about Shinobu's poison for a second. Shinobu's poison uses wisteria flower a type of plant that demons are weak to. Even if the demons don't die from this poison, it does render them weak and slows their ability to regenerate. So why the fuck doesn't every demon slayer coat their blade with this shit? That sounds like a pretty useful debuff to carry around. Really good way to level the playing field. It's not even established that wisteria flowers are particularly rare. There shouldn't be any reason the other demon slayers can't use it. When you write a power system into a series like this, the audience needs to understand the basic rules behind it so they can determine the capabilities and limitations of each character. Gotoge doesn't want you to understand breathing because then he would actually have to put some thought into writing this crap. Speaking of things that don't have a lot of thought put into them, let's talk about Tanjiro. I don't like Tanjiro, and it's for the exact same reason that I think a lot of other people do like him. Tanjiro is a very good boy. That's pretty much his entire character. I would describe Tanjiro as a character that is designed to be liked. Now, obviously most characters are designed for the audience to like them, but the problem with Tanjiro is that he's designed to be liked first, and designed as an actual character second. Something I've talked about across every manga video I've ever made is that writing a good character means writing them to be human. And to be human is to have flaws. You want your character to have flaws because you want the audience to be able to relate to them. You want them to look and say, hey, this character struggles with anxiety. That's something I can relate to. 
Now I can empathize with their struggles. Tanjiro doesn't have flaws. He's a perfect ray of sunshine that does no wrong. His personality does not conflict with the other characters once they get to know him, they all just get along. And when they all get along, there is no room for character conflict, which is an incredibly effective writing tool that can both make a story more interesting and push it forward. Genuinely, trying to list Tanjiro's weaknesses as a person is like Michael Scott listing his weaknesses for David Wallace. What do you think your greatest strengths as a manager? Why don't I tell you what my greatest weaknesses are? I work too hard, I care too much, and sometimes I can be too invested in my job. Okay. Now with that being said, there is room for Tanjiro to have a weakness that still makes him look good. When Orokodaki first meets Tanjiro, his first thought is that Tanjiro is too kind for his own good, which makes him hesitate to kill his enemies. He hesitates so much that the sun comes up and kills the demon before Tanjiro can. In this story, caring too much could be a really big weakness for Tanjiro because it would prevent him from killing dangerous enemies quickly. Yet after training with Orokodaki, that side of his character disappears entirely. Don't get me wrong, he's still extremely kind, but it doesn't hold him back anymore. You could call this character development, but it isn't. It's resolved too fast. It doesn't affect the plot at any point. Tanjiro doesn't actually go through the steps of developing, it just kinda happens. It's like if an Olympic runner hopped in a golf cart, drove around the track, and then crossed the finish line. Just because they crossed the finish line doesn't mean they ran the race, and they definitely don't deserve an award for it. There is one other example of a potential flaw for Tanjiro that gets negated entirely. Throughout the story, during his tough battles, Tanjiro repeatedly breaks his sword. Now, I actually really liked this at first because the fragility of katana-style swords was brought up and explained very early in the series. So I saw Tanjiro breaking his sword over and over as a major flaw in his ability to fight that he needs to overcome. But no! After the third time that happens, Tanjiro goes to the swordsmith village and they explain that it's not his fault! His blacksmith is the one to blame for making swords that break so easily! He'll never change! He'll never change! Ever since he was 15, always the same! Couldn't stop breaking his swords! But not our Tanjiro! Couldn't be precious Tanjiro! And he gets to be a demon slayer? What a sick joke! So for this reason, I find Tanjiro to be an incredibly boring character. He has no character growth or development, and he really doesn't struggle throughout the story beyond struggling in a fight. Mind you, I don't think every character needs to be written as a piece of shit to be engaging. You can write lovable characters that are still flawed. But writing a character with the intention of making them universally likable rather ironically makes them the least likable character of all, because they don't inspire any kind of emotion. What's engaging about a character that doesn't have to struggle or change? They're just boring. Tanjiro is boring. And not only is Tanjiro boring, so is how he is utilized in this story. I'm gonna say something that some people might have a problem with, but I need you to hear me out before you get all up in arms. Tanjiro is a chosen one. Now you might immediately disagree with me because no, Tanjiro is never referred to as the chosen one in this story, nor is there a prophecy for telling his exploits, which is how a lot of chosen one stories play out. But in terms of his exploits and how he affects the world, Tanjiro is absolutely the chosen one. So to set the stage for this explanation, we need to understand some of the lore behind Demon Slayer. All of the demons in Demon Slayer were created using the blood of a single demon. That demon is Muzan Kibutsuji and he's creating other demons in order to try to find a way to negate his weakness to sunlight. The strongest demons under Muzan's control are known as the 12 Kizuki, and they're ranked from strongest to weakest, with the weakest six being known as the lower rank Kizuki, and the strongest six the upper rank Kizuki. This is really important for us to know because at the time Demon Slayer takes place, it has been more than a hundred years since an upper rank Kizuki was killed. Within the Demon Slayer core, there is also a ranking system based on strength. There are 10 different ranks a Demon Slayer can achieve, and this is something you do not need to remember at all. It has literally zero impact on the plot and very, very rarely gets brought up. The only reason I'm even bringing it up is to make fun of how lazy and pointless it is. What you do need to know is that there is one additional rank not included on this list, and that is the Hashira. The Hashira are the strongest Demon Slayers in the Demon Slayer core. During this period, there are nine 
Hashida. So, over the past hundred plus years, not a single Hashida has managed to kill an upper rank demon. That's important because it shows that Muzan's demons and the demons their core are not equal in strength. Until Tanjiro joins. That's an upper rank demon. And that's his head being removed, thereby killing him. So that's pretty huge, huh? First upper rank demon to go down in over a century. How did we get there? Over the course of his adventures, Tanjiro made some friends. He met Zenitsu, a thunder breathing user who is the worst character in this series. We'll talk about that later. And Inosuke, who is funny. I like Inosuke. Funny boarhead man make me giggle. Tanjiro is joined by Zenitsu, Inosuke, and the Hashira Uzui in battling the weakest upper rank demon, which is actually two demons who need to have their heads cut off at the same time to kill them. At this time, Tanjiro and his friends are Kanoe, meaning they're the fourth out of the ten ranks. This is literally the only time in the story that Tanjiro's current rank is ever brought up. So don't get confused in thinking this matters, but I'm glad we have it so I can establish where we're at. Tanjiro and his friends are still in the bottom half of the ranks. You've got three, four out of ten slayers, one demon, and one Hashira fighting an upper rank demon level pair. Now it could be argued that Tanjiro is actually stronger than his current rank would suggest, and I would argue that he is. The reason for that is because before this battle, Tanjiro awakened to a new power. This is the Hinokami Kagura, later revealed to be sun breathing. Sun breathing is the first and strongest form of breathing, which was passed down in Tanjiro's family line in the form of a ceremonial dance. Now, I have a question about sun breathing. Why is it the strongest? Or more specifically, why is Tanjiro stronger for being able to use it? It's established that sun breathing is the first form of total concentration breathing and that every other form of breathing is an offshoot of sun breathing that was developed for demon slayers that found sun breathing too difficult to utilize. Now this could be a decent explanation for why it's so powerful, but it really isn't. One reason you could give is that sun breathing is the strongest because it negates the weaknesses inherent in every other lesser form. But we've already established that each type of breathing is functionally the same, with none of them having any major drawbacks. So what we're left with is the explanation that sun breathing is strong because it's hard to do, which is a pretty terrible explanation. You know what else is hard to do? Getting through Demon Slayer without clawing my eyes out. But am I a stronger person for being able to do it? Apparently not. This also seriously calls into question the actual strength of the Hashida, because it stands to reason that a novice or even intermediate level sun breathing user would be weaker than a master sounding user. Yet, which one of these fuckheads lost an arm in this fight? I don't think Tanjiro is stronger than Uzui at this time, for the record. But this will feed into a point I'm going to make later. So, we've got Tanjiro awakening to a long-lost, powerful form of breathing that no one else is capable of using. That's chosen one indicator number one. Shockingly, sun breathing is not the only magical power buff that Tanjiro suddenly awakens to when he needs it. This is the Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. The Mark is explained pretty vaguely, but the basic idea is that manifesting the Mark just makes you stronger. It's Demon Slayer's version of Super Saiyan, and just like Super Saiyan, it stops being special pretty quickly. See, the interesting thing about the Mark is that it can only be manifested if the user has been in contact with someone else who has already manifested the Mark. So that begs the question, how did Tanjiro manifest it? Well. Tanjiro was born on the first full moon during a summer equinox in the 20th century, making him, I'm just fucking with you, there's no reason. It's established that the first Mark user was born with it already on his face. This is not the case for Tanjiro, as it's established that the scar on his face came from an injury. No explanation for why Tanjiro gets the Mark is ever offered. He's just special that way, I guess. And as just explained, after Tanjiro manifests the Mark, so do some of the other Demon Slayers, allowing the Demon Slayer core to grow in strength thanks to Tanjiro. So, now we have Tanjiro awakening another long-lost, powerful ability, inexplicably, which allows other people to be stronger just by the very nature of Tanjiro's existence. 
Chosen one indicator number two. Finally, we've got the fact that Tanjiro defeated an upper rank demon at all. I am sorry, but this victory just does not make sense. We've got three weaker than Hashida demon slayers, one Hashida, and one demon that doesn't contribute to the fight much. It makes even less sense when you consider that the demons wield a poison that every character is for some reason immune to. The poison is supposed to at least weaken them, but they still manage to win. If not one upper ranked demon has been killed in over a hundred years, then the fact that they managed to do it here just makes me think that the Demon Slayer Corps wasn't trying very hard. Even knowing that Tanjiro had to awaken two power buffs to pull it off. What this victory says to me is that over the past century, not one person in the Demon Slayer Corps thought teamwork would be a good idea. It took three Kanoe and one Hashida to take down an upper ranked demon. There are nine Hashida! Are you really telling me that none of them ever thought to work together to take down an upper rank? There is a possible defense here. It stated at some point, I can't remember when, that the Hashida are each busy because they cover a territory that they protect from demons. So maybe an explanation is that they simply can't get the Hashida together at the same time to fight an upper rank. But this is bullshit for a number of reasons. Number one, they all gather in one spot twice a year to meet with the leader of the Demon Slayer Corps. Number two, if that is the explanation, then it's indicative of very poor strategic thinking on the leader of the Demon Slayers that they can't organize other Demon Slayers to cover the Hashida's territory while they hunt the upper ranks. And number three, if the Hashida can't get together, then why not make a requirement that each Hashida has four or five high-ranking Demon Slayers working with them at any given time in case they encounter an upper rank? The problem here is an issue of convincing the audience. The idea that it has been 100 years since an upper rank was killed is a huge bar to clear. It suggests that even several Hashida would not be enough to take one down. So that means Gotoge needs to put in the work to show that Tanjiro and his friends are strong enough to change that. And what we have now is just not very convincing. Remember the lower rank Kizuki? The six weakest out of the 12 strongest demons? Tanjiro fought only two of these and seriously struggled with them before taking on the upper ranks. After that, Gotoge just wrote them out of the story completely. This was a huge mistake. Tanjiro should not have defeated an upper rank until it was shown that he could single-handedly take down a lower rank with relative ease, because that would be great evidence of his growth. Instead, they're treated like worthless cannon fodder by Muzan, which just makes it harder to believe that Tanjiro can take down an upper rank since he struggled so much with the lower ranks. The reality is that there is no valid explanation for why not a single upper rank demon has been killed over the past hundred years. And this is the final and greatest indicator that Tanjiro is the chosen one. This is what I like to call the center of the world protagonist writing method. The idea behind it is that the entire world is stagnant and unchanging until the protagonist becomes a part of it. At which point the world suddenly starts changing and moving forward. I have never seen an example of this writing method being used that works. It is always bad because it suggests that nothing can happen in a story's world without the involvement of the protagonist. The best stories in writing display a living, breathing world where things happen that affect the protagonist and their story without them having to be directly involved in those events. The worst stories do the opposite. It is not impossible to write a character as a chosen one and have it be good but this is not one of those examples. Speaking of being the chosen one, did you know that I have a Patreon? If this video didn't make you hate me, then for just five bucks a month, you get access to all kinds of behind the scenes and extra content such as early access to new videos and weekly progress updates. Your contributions help me buy new equipment to make my videos better that I wouldn't be able to afford otherwise, and I really appreciate that because I want to make more great videos for you guys. If you can't afford the Patreon, liking the video is always very appreciated because that tells YouTube people want to see this stuff. Thanks again for your support. Let's get back to dunking on popular anime number 413. The character writing in Demon Slayer is atrocious. Hell, it's a bit insulting to other writers to even call it character writing. I should say the care cutcher writing in Demon Slayer is atrocious. These characters have no depth, they are obnoxious, and I can't stand them. This is Zenitsu. I hate Zenitsu. His two characteristics are that he is horny and a coward. His character does not have any depth beyond that. 
He gets scared and cries and screams constantly, or he tries to sexually assault the female characters. That's it! That's all there is to him! Now, the cowardly part of Zenitsu's character could be and should be thought of as a personal flaw for him to overcome, given that, as a demon slayer, he is too scared to fight demons. You would think that would hold him back and make him a liability, leading to an internal conflict and a desire to change. But well, that's not what happens. You see, instead of having to overcome his personal flaw and change to be a better person, Zenitsu just falls asleep. And that allows him to fight while asleep. Are you trying to piss me off? I can accept the whole only able to fight while asleep thing as quirky anime shit, but here's the problem with it. This is not a limitation for Zenitsu because functionally there is zero difference between Zenitsu being awake or asleep other than that he is less annoying. While asleep, Zenitsu is still capable of rational thought and we can hear his unconscious inner monologue, which is a total oxymoron. He's even capable of speaking and communicating with other characters and strategizing with them. So he's just awake with more steps. It's just quirky for the sake of being quirky. It's a complete waste of character writing. There is a way to write this and have it not suck. It could be that while asleep, he loses the ability to tell the difference between friend and foe, thus making him a threat to the others. Or maybe while asleep, he fights recklessly because there's very little thought behind his actions, thus making it very dangerous for him. Both of those scenarios would make this facet of his character a limitation and therefore something he could overcome. Hell, you could even do something as simple as giving him a scenario where he wants to fight, but can't overcome his fear and can't fall asleep, forcing him to deal with one of those limitations. But nothing like that ever happens. Neither of these things hold him back. Zenitsu is also supposedly a total fuck up. Each of the different breathing techniques have a number of specific techniques for some reason. Zenitsu is a user of mouth breathing, thunder breathing, which has six forms. But Zenitsu is only capable of using the first of those six forms, which you would think would be a big deal, but no. Not only does it not hold him back at all, he also never overcomes this limitation. So this is really character writing one-on-one. -on -one. When you write a character with a flaw or limitation, that flaw or limitation should cause problems for that character. If it doesn't, then it isn't really a flaw or a limitation. It's just wasted writing. Gotoge wants to have it both ways. He wants to have a funny coward character, and he also wants a character that can pull off cool feats. However, because of the way Zenitsu is written, he fails remarkably in both areas. He's obnoxious as a comic relief character, and his feats lack weight because of the lazy way he's written. But okay, Mac, I hear you typing in the comments. Zenitsu is an easy target. You cherry pick this example to back up your point. Sure, that's a fair statement. I think a lot of people who actually like Demon Slayer can admit that Zenitsu is pretty shit. So why don't we take a crack at a fan favorite? In fact, Rengoku is so loved by the community that when I asked ChatGPT to tell me why he sucks as a character, the AI refused to do it out of fear of being canceled. Luckily, I have no such fear, so I can say in plain terms that Rengoku is a terribly written character. Rengoku is introduced alongside the rest of the Hashira. He's immediately introduced by talking about how Nezuko is a demon and should therefore be killed without being given a proper chance, and that Tanjiro should also be killed for protecting her. After that, we don't see Rengoku again until Tanjiro and his gang get sent to a demon slaying job on a train, where Rengoku immediately makes a complete 180 by being very friendly towards Tanjiro and his friends. Now, credit where credit is due. One of Rengoku's characteristics is that he's a very direct character. He doesn't hold back when he's talking. So you could chalk this up to that aspect of his character. But we're also going to see that he's an extremely kind and caring person. Wanting to kill Tanjiro without giving him a chance to explain himself kind of goes against that. Listen, Tanjiro, I think you're a great guy and I'm sure you have your reasons. But as you can clearly see in the Demon Slayer handbook, you broke the dress code policy, so I'm gonna have to kill you and your entire family. Now, in terms of Rengoku's character writing, he's really not that bad. He's not good either. He's an incredibly boring character. He's a generic good boy, a lot like Tanjiro in many ways, but I don't actively hate him like Zenitsu. The real problem with Rengoku is how he is utilized in this story. Rengoku's primary involvement takes place during the Mugen train arc where the crew has to fight a demon that has melded with a train and Jesus, look at that. Demon Slayer really does have peak animation quality.
Throughout the arc, Rengoku puts a lot of faith in Tanjiro and his boys, while Rengoku focuses on protecting the humans riding the train. That is, until they defeat the demon and the train derails, spilling gallons of toxic chemicals. None of this would have happened if the demon had prioritized rail safety over its bottom line. Tanjiro inhaled some of the vinyl chloride so he's out of commission, when suddenly... <laughs> the third, upper-ranked demon appears. This is the first time an upper-ranked demon appears in the story, so of course he has to make an impression. Rengoku is on his own to fight the demon, at least at first, and he puts up a pretty good fight. The demon clearly has the upper hand, but Rengoku knows he can't back down or Tanjiro and the other humans will die. So he fights on, for as long as he can. But the strength of one human only amounts to so much. I'm sorry. I meant the strength of one human only amounts to so much when they aren't the main character. As Rengoku bleeds out of his donut hole, he thinks back to his childhood. He remembers a lesson his mother taught him about how people who are born strong have a duty to protect those that are weaker than them. With his remaining strength, he tries to kill the demon, but it isn't enough. The demon escapes as the sun rises because it sure would be inconvenient if the demon could still fight after killing Rengoku. Before kicking the bucket for good, Rengoku offers some advice to Tanjiro and his friends. He tells them not to give up, and to keep fighting. He tells them that he believes in their strength, and he knows they'll be able to become Hashida themselves someday. Finally, he sees a vision of his late mother and asks her if he was able to use his strength well. She tells him he did, giving him a feeling of relief as he breathes his last breath. Here's why Rengoku's death doesn't work. We did not know Rengoku long enough for his death to be meaningful. What Gotoge is trying to do here is to introduce a character right before they get killed and then try to convince us that their death is meaningful because he wants Tanjiro and his friends to find motivation in the death of someone they cared about without having to kill off an established character. I mean, Gotoge isn't gonna kill off Zenitsu, God forbid. Where would the series be without Zenitsu? So instead we get Rengoku and it's shit because Rengoku was written to be missed. What do I mean by that? I called Rengoku a generic good boy earlier, and that's what I'm talking about. We as the audience are supposed to see Rengoku and say, oh my goodness, he's such a sweet boy. He cares so much about people and he believes in Tanjiro. That way when he gets fisted, we're supposed to react with, no, not Rengoku, he's such a sweet boy. He cares so much about people and he believes in Tanjiro. He's written so that we as the audience are sad about his death. But this is a terrible approach. Rengoku, like Tanjiro, is a flawless character, which means he's boring for the same reasons. Kratos, Walter White, Guts. What do all these characters have in common? They are incredibly flawed characters that the audience loves despite their imperfection. Because flawed characters are relatable. You, as the audience, can relate to Kratos' self-hatred or Walt's selfishness, or Guts' rage. And even though they sometimes do terrible things, you root for them because you want to believe that they can overcome their flaws. Because that means you can overcome your flaws. Flawless characters are not relatable because people are not flawless. If the audience can't relate to a character, then how on earth are we meant to be sad about their death? I said before that Rengoku's death doesn't work because we didn't know him long enough, but that's not really the problem. After all, I praised the writing of Himeno in Chainsaw Man, and she died in even fewer chapters than Rengoku. The problem is that Rengoku is written as an incomplete character. He has no flaws, he has no relationship with the other characters, and we did not learn what he lived for, what his motivations were. And no, I don't count his desire to protect people as a motivation because his mommy told him to is a super weak reason for that desire since that relationship wasn't fleshed out. It is possible to have Rengoku exist and have his death be meaningful. One easy way would be to make Rengoku an asshole. When Rengoku was first introduced, he had no faith in Nezuko and wanted to kill Tanjiro. Let's keep that. Then when they meet on the train and the demon attacks, have Rengoku try to kill Nezuko because he's convinced she'll attack the civilians. 
make him a hindrance on Tanjiro and his team because Ren Goku's priorities aren't straight. Then, gradually, have him realize that Nezuko is trying to help and have him begrudgingly put his faith in her. After the train derails, let's have upper rank three appear and try to abduct or kill Nezuko while she's incapacitated and let Rengoku die protecting her because he realized she's on humanity's side. Then we can have his last words have a lot of weight. Rengoku can admit to Tanjiro that his way of thinking was archaic and wrong. Have Rengoku realize that he and his old ways can't defeat Muzan and tell Tanjiro that it's him and his new ways that will finally end this fight. Rengoku tells Tanjiro he believes in him and kicks the bucket. This scenario serves three purposes that would improve this story. First, it makes Rengoku a relatable character while maintaining his likability because he comes around at the end. Second, it displays character growth that is sorely lacking in this series. And third, it gives a reason for why Tanjiro is capable of breaking the stalemate between humans and demons. It establishes that Tanjiro and his new way of thinking will change the Demon Slayer core and give them the ability to win. Is it a bit generic? Yeah, absolutely. But it's better than the feeling of indifference I get from Rengoku's actual death. At least in my scenario, we can imagine the potential for change that Rengoku has, and in that knowledge, we can miss who he could have become. That makes his death mean something. Rengoku is not a bad character. He's just incredibly sterile and boring. As a result, I can't feel bad about his death, which means his death does very little for the story. All right, one more example. Let's talk about Genya, because boy, oh boy, do I have some things to say about this lad. Genya is possibly, if not the single greatest missed opportunity in this entire series. Genya is a character that is introduced very early in the series, all the way back during Tanjiro's test to become a demon slayer. Back then, he was immediately introduced as a total piece of shit. He was impatient and wanted his sword right after passing the test. He hit the girl running the test, and he had the gall to express a negative opinion about a popular anime on the internet. I don't really like Demon Slayer. <laughs> I've had a good chuckle over that one. I'm coming after you. After that, he disappeared for a long time, only to show back up during the Swordsmith Village arc. Genya was again shown to be a total asshole by being very rude to Tanjiro. But we learn a lot more about him in this arc, such that he has brothers with this stupid scar guy from the Hashida. They aren't on very good terms either. Genya just wants his Onichan to notice him, but Scar Man wants Genya to fuck off. There's also one huge thing about Genya that is the ultimate example of the complete lack of focus in this series. Genya cannot use breathing techniques for some reason. That will never be explained. See, this is a predictable problem. I mentioned earlier that if you're going to have a power system like breathing techniques that every character uses, there needs to be a better explanation for how it works than what we're given. It is literally just breathing a certain way. Yet for some unexplained reason, Genya is incapable of breathing, apparently. The only reason we're given for why breathing could possibly be inaccessible to some humans is that it's apparently very taxing on the body. So all you need to do in order to explain why Genya can't use breathing is to tell me he has respiratory problems or something. He's got a medical exemption and he can't wear a mask to the grocery store. That's enough for me at this point. But we don't even get that. In fact, it's even worse than that. You might be wondering how someone like Genya is capable of surviving as a Demon Slayer given that breathing techniques are how Demon Slayers level the playing field in the face of a demon's strength. Well, Genya has a unique ability. He can eat the flesh of a demon in order to temporarily gain access to their powers, including their regenerative abilities. So that raises the question, how is that possible? Well, Genya has special digestive organs. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think that was a transition into a more detailed explanation? Yeah. Well, I did too. But no, that's it. His tummy is special, and that means he can become a demon for a bit. It's also established that he is literally the only person that can do this. Genya's inclusion in this story is a huge mistake on Gotoge's part, because Genya's existence rather ironically deconstructs Tanjiro as a protagonist. I mentioned earlier that one of the things I find frustrating about this series is that Tanjiro's very existence manages to break a century-old stalemate between the demons and the humans. 
As soon as Tanjiro becomes a part of the Demon Slayer core, things suddenly start moving in the direction of defeating Muzan. The one and only defense that I can think of for this aspect of Demon Slayer's writing is that Tanjiro is special. He has the mark on his face that increases his physical abilities, as well as the ability to use sun breathing, which is inexplicably stronger than the other breathing techniques. These abilities are what set Tanjiro apart from the other Demon Slayers, and it's that edge that arguably allows him to break the stalemate. So what the fuck? Genya is special too! The motherfucker can literally use the power of demons against them, yet he's been unable to achieve the same feats as Tanjiro? Hell, Genya's abilities are theoretically better than Tanjiro's. It's established upon their introduction that breathing techniques are used to grant the Demon Slayer demon-like physical abilities. Well, Genya's demonification does the same thing on top of giving him demon-like regenerative abilities. Genya is capable of fighting demons on a more level playing field than any other character in this story, yet you'd be shocked to find out that he does not do anything notable to break the stalemate the way Tanjiro does. Genya having special abilities does not automatically allow him to be stronger than the other demon slayers. So his existence in this story puts a massive spotlight on the flaw of writing that is Tanjiro as a protagonist. And lastly, to add insult to injury, after Tanjiro and Genya fight together, Genya suddenly stops being the massive asshole that he was shown to be. He's just a nice guy all of a sudden. That is not character development. He was never given a reason to change, nor did he go through the process of changing. Genya is by far the worst written character in Demon Slayer, and yet, unbelievably, Genya is the rule, not the exception. A caricature is an art form in which the artist takes the notable features of their subject and exaggerates them to a comical degree, and that's why I called this caricature writing earlier. These characters have one or two characteristics that are exaggerated and thrown in your face constantly. Despite what you may think, I don't expect every character to have an ocean's level of depth. But these motherfuckers don't even have puddles. These characters are the basin in a desert that used to be an ocean millions of years ago, but now you just find nothing but dust to choke on. What you see is what you get. They are surface level, they are boring and obnoxious. It wouldn't be so bad if Gotoge wasn't trying desperately to convince you that these characters are deeper than they appear. He does this by making sure that legitimately every fucking character gets a backstory. The good guys get backstories, the bad guys get backstories, the barely relevant characters get backstories. It's a goddamn backstory battle royale where they're all competing to be the least relevant. Now I know this is rich coming from me because, but having a lot of backstories is not in and of itself a problem. The issue is that none of the backstories are used in a meaningful way. You can do a lot with a backstory. You can use it to explain why a character is the way that they are, or to explain events that led to the situation the characters are in, or simply as a world building tool. Gotoge mostly uses them to throw exposition about characters at you, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. The problem is a matter of relevance to the story and characters. This is used for every single demon that Tanjiro defeats. Before they die, each of them has to recount their sob story of how they were abused as humans and what led to them being demons in the first place. Now, I've actually seen a lot of people praise this aspect of the writing, but I don't really understand why. A theme throughout Demon Slayer is that every demon was once human and that, at heart, they might not necessarily be evil. For example, during the backstory of the first upper-ranked demon that Tanjo and his friends defeated, you learn that they mostly did what they did to protect each other. But what does knowing that change for us as the audience? How does that knowledge recontextualize their actions? Again, I understand the desire to humanize the demons, but the problem is that nothing is done with that concept. Let's talk about world building, which is something that Demon Slayer is sorely lacking in. There is nothing done to establish the state of the world at large outside of the limited sphere of the Demon Slayer core and their battle against the demons. I say limited because the existence of the demons, and therefore the demons their core, is not even general knowledge. Demons are few enough in number that they're seen as urban legend. So that begs the question, what is going on outside this limited sphere? If we're in the Taisho era, then how is World War I affecting the demon slayer's ability to operate? What's the state of the common people and how does it relate to the demon's threat to humankind? These are questions that are not and will not ever be answered. 
Hell, even a basic explanation of where in Japan all this is taking place is not answered, nor is there any kind of explanation as to how each location in the story relates to one another. It's like levels in a video game. You're at Demon Slayer HQ, then you're at the Butterfly Mansion, then you're at the Entertainment District without any idea what it took to get there. This is terrible. Demon Slayer wants us to believe that demons are a threat to humans without showing us how large of a threat they are or if they even impact daily life for the average person. Now, what does this have to do with backstories? Well, I mentioned earlier that backstories can be used for world building, and there's an excellent missed opportunity to do that here. There is one common theme across every backstory in this world, and that's cruelty. Nearly every demon in this story had humans do straight up awful things to them before they were demons. Many of the demon slayers were also treated cruelly throughout their lives. So let's use that to build our world. Tanjiro grew up in a small, closed society. It would be very easy to write a scenario where Tanjiro is ignorant to the ways of the world outside of his small village. It could be that upon going out into it, Tanjiro realizes the world is not as kind as he would have imagined. This would contrast well with his kindness as a character. It could then be bolstered through learning the backstories of the demons he fights. Tanjiro could start his story with the naive belief that ridding the world of Muzan and his demons will make it a better place, only to slowly realize that humans are just as cruel to one another. That realization could lead to Tanjiro recognizing that Muzan still needs to be defeated, but that the world won't be fixed if that happens. It would give him a motivation to make the world a better place even after Muzan's eventual defeat. As it stands, the question of what the fuck Tanjiro would do with his life after beating Muzan is unanswered, which isn't a good thing. Is it a bit cliche to go for the whole humans are the real demons all along thing? Yeah, a little. But again, it gives meaning to those backstories where currently there is none. As it stands, it's not even like Tanjiro learns the backstories of his friends or enemies. They exist purely for us as the audience. Yet they also ironically don't do anything for us. Right now, they only serve to explain where certain characteristics come from, such as why Zenitsu is such a fuck up, or why Genya's brother hates him. He doesn't actually. The question becomes how many of those characteristics really need to be explained, and the answer is often that they don't. Now you may be confused, because a lot of my problems with Demon Slayer come from a lack of explanation, yet here I am saying character quirks don't need to be explained. The problem is when a lack of explanation creates holes in your ability to understand the story. I don't need to know why Snake Man wears a mask because he is a side character with very little plot relevance. Spend less time on that and more time fleshing out breathing. Telling your audience that this is just who they are is often enough. And while I understand why people enjoy the demons being humanized through the backstory, it's ultimately meaningless if nothing is done with that information, so they don't actually add anything to story and they don't need to exist. Now the biggest thing the Demon Slayer has going for it is its action segments. The anime is done by Ufo Table, who also works on a lot of the Fate anime, and yeah, they're pretty good at what they do. The action scenes are great to watch. However, I read the manga, and the action scenes in the manga are very poorly executed. It's really important for the art in an action manga to convey what is going on from one panel to the next so the reader can follow what is happening. Some standout examples that do this really well are Sakamoto Days and Jujutsu Kaisen. It's so easy to understand the flow of combat. There are parts of a scene that you can use to orient your understanding of the scene and recognize the character's relationship to one another as they clash. This is not true of Demon Slayer. The action is severely weakened because it often becomes near impossible to follow what's happening. Take a look at this great page, where the onomatopoeia actually blocks the action so you can't see anything. Or this page here. If you're seeing this page for the first time without any context, please do me a favor and take a guess at what is happening in the comments. Look, art is subjective. In fact, all of this is. If you're thinking of leaving a comment at some point informing me that all of this is my opinion, then congratulations, you're right. You stated a fact that does not counter my arguments or disprove my points. While you're down by the comments, you wanna hit that like button? But more than anything else, art is extremely subjective. So I don't wanna talk about this too long, but I can't stand the art direction of Demon Slayer. The action fails so hard to visualize what an attack is supposed to do that Gotoge feels the need to explain all of them rather than just showing you. More often than not, attacks simply lack weight because there's no clear idea of what effect it's having. 
It's funny because this is not true at all in some cases. Oftentimes, sun breathing attacks are very impactful. Other times, I can't even tell if the attack did anything, like with many water breathing attacks. And Jesus, the character designs are awful. What is this? They look like they were ripped off a teenager's DeviantArt page. This guy is supposed to be the main villain? I'm supposed to be intimidated by him? He looks like he's about to tip his fedora to milady. He looks like what a Redditor thinks looks cool. <laughs> uh, I look like a jackass. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> and why do they all look like kids? Like every single character looks like a child. Some of them are. Tanjo's only 15, but this dude's 27? He looks like he just got to high school. Even the old characters look like children dressing up like adults. If your story is gonna be so remarkably incompetent, can it at least be pretty? The last thing I wanna talk about is how Demon Slayer wraps up plot lines, which means we enter the territory of anime-only spoilers. So, if you don't have the ending of this mess spoiled, please skip ahead to the following timecode to hear my final thoughts. Demon Slayer has an absolutely abysmal method of setting up and resolving things. Gotoge will set something up and then either instantly resolve it or not take the proper steps to make the resolution mean something. I mentioned earlier that Zenitsu never gets past the hurdle of only being able to use one form of thunder breathing, but that was only partly true. He does get past it, but I'll let you decide the validity of that resolution. In the final arc of the story, which is a huge battle between all of the remaining demons and all of the demon slayers, Zenitsu single-handedly battles the new upper rank six demon, who also happens to be his old rival. Now you might be a bit confused because I never mentioned Zenitsu having a rival. Well, neither does the manga, not really anyway. This character is briefly shown in Zenitsu's backstory. His name is Kai Gaku and he chastises Zenitsu for being such a fuck up. They're both students of the same teacher and both users of thunder breathing. Now, this could have been really good. Kai Gaku gets introduced very early in the story, so a final battle between him and Zenitsu could have been really strong. But it falls completely flat because there is no build up to this moment. Kai Gaku is not mentioned or shown a single time between his backstory and his final battle. His existence is barely even alluded to. Right before their final battle, Zenitsu gets a letter informing him that Kaigaku became a demon. This is the motivation Zenitsu needs to finally train and become stronger. Completely off screen. My question is, why couldn't this have been done throughout the story instead of right before it needed to happen? Why couldn't Zenitsu constantly have Kaigaku in the back of his mind, someone stronger that he looks up to that inspires him to fight? Then, when Kaigaku becomes a demon, it could shatter Zenitsu, leaving him heartbroken that Kaigaku could do such a thing while also giving him the ultimate motivation to fight. When Zenitsu and Kaigaku fight, it's revealed that Zenitsu has gotten over his fear and no longer needs to sleep in order to fight. And ultimately, Zenitsu defeats Kaigaku by using a new thunder breathing form, a seventh form that Zenitsu created. So, he got past his fear and his one move limitation. But both of those things happened with zero buildup, so they have absolutely no weight. It's like I talked about earlier with Tanjiro, we're getting character development that skips the actual development process. Not to mention that Zenitsu getting past these limitations means nothing if he was never held back by them in the first place. I mean, the idea that Zenitsu can invent a new move, but is incapable of learning the established ones is itself pretty ridiculous. You know what would have worked better? In the beginning, Zenitsu only knows the first move. Then, throughout the story, he slowly masters the other five forms, allowing him to grow stronger and overcome his limits. Then, in this final battle, he pulls out his new move. It would be the ultimate indication that Zenitsu has actually grown stronger and become a thunder-breathing master. As it stands, we have payoff with no buildup, and this is common for Demon Slayer. This is how many plot points are handled. There are scant few examples of character developments or plot twists that are handled well. One good one is Tamayo. Tamayo is introduced very early in the story as a demon that does not eat people. She resents Muzan and wants to find a way to turn demons back into humans. Because of this goal, Tamayo and Tanjiro's goals are linked because Tanjiro wants to make Nezuko human again. To this end, Tamayo asks Tanjiro to collect the blood of one of the 12 Kizuki. 
This is something that is on his mind and referenced across multiple battles until Tanjiro finally manages to do it after battling upper rank 6. That blood is then used to not only make a demon curing medicine, but also to make a poison to destroy Muzan in the final battle. That poison is what weakens Muzan enough for Tanjiro and the others to ultimately defeat him. This is all great. Tamayo and her goal are introduced early, then referenced frequently throughout the story, then the payoff of that setup is meaningful. This stuff isn't hard, guys. All of it should look like this. The ending of this mess is barely worth talking about. From an art director's perspective, the entire thing is a mess of random attacks. There's no flow or choreography whatsoever. Everyone works together to defeat Muzan, a bunch of people die. In his dying moment, Muzan makes Tanjiro into a demon. They use the medicine to turn him back, and everything is fine. The most offensive part of the ending is the last chapter, where for some dumbass reason, it cuts to modern day and shows how all of the characters' descendants turned out? Like, why? Just to confirm some ships? This doesn't do anything. It doesn't add anything to the existing story. And let's not forget that there would have to be some serious inbreeding happening for all these characters to look so much like their ancestors. I mean, Jesus, they even have matching scars! The ending is stupid, it doesn't leave an impact, it doesn't pay things off in a meaningful way, and as one last fuck you, it's revealed that Tanjiro's family can inexplicably become demons that are immune to being killed by sunlight. Chalk it up to generations of incest or something. Chosen one indicator number four. Ultimately, the main and biggest problem with Demon Slayer comes from a lack of focus. Demon Slayer wants to overload you with useless information instead of fleshing out the things that matter. It wants to show you every character's backstory, but not do anything with any of them. It wants you to be sad about Rengoku's death, but refuses to take the time to make you care about him. It wants you to believe demons are not inherently evil, but doesn't want to do anything with that premise. It wants you to believe Tanjiro can shift the tides of war, but shows you again you can't do the same. It wants you to believe sun breathing is the strongest form of breathing, but doesn't give a valid explanation for why. A lot of the answers to the questions I posed throughout this video can be answered by saying because Gotoge said so. Sun breathing is strong because Gotoge said so. Genya isn't special because Gotoge said so. Rengoku's death is sad because Gotoge said so. Gotoge does not take the time to flesh out any of these ideas because of a severe lack of focus. He just wants you to trust him and not ask questions. I read that Demon Slayer came to be when one of Gotoge's editors suggested that he writes a story with an easy to understand theme. And it seems to me that he took that to mean write a story that is so brain dead even a four year old can understand it. You can write a meaningful and deep story that has an easy to understand theme. The message of every single one of my favorite series can be summed up in a single sentence, but unlike Demon Slayer, they still manage to be competent pieces of writing that are deep and meaningful. Throughout the course of writing this video, I came to realize that many of the things I criticize about Demon Slayer are not things that I feel the need to criticize in other manga. That's because I do not expect the things I read to be perfect. Every series has flaws, and it isn't fair to expect them not to. But with other series that I am not so critical of, they all have things that make them incredible that allow me to give them a break where they aren't perfect. I can forgive lacking world building if the character writing is strong, I can forgive mediocre character writing if the action is engaging. And I can forgive boring action if the world building is incredible. The problem with Demon Slayer is that it doesn't do anything particularly well, and it does many things very poorly. So I can't accept Demon Slayer's flaws because there is simply no silver lining to point to. At least in the case of the manga. I think I understand why a lot of people watch Demon Slayer. They watch Demon Slayer for the same reason that I watch Kitchen Nightmares. I watch Kitchen Nightmares a lot while I'm editing or gaming, but I know it's not a very good show. It's trashy reality TV, the editing is atrocious, the format is predictable, but I still enjoy watching it because funny, angry British man. I like to imagine that most people enjoy Demon Slayer for a similar reason. I want to believe that they know the writing is atrocious, world building non-existent, and generally lacks focus, but they enjoy watching it nonetheless because they find the animated fights enjoyable. It's something to just turn your brain off and watch. That's what I want to believe, at least. But then I see all these video essays calling Demon Slayer peak fiction or saying it's redefining the shonen genre. 
or I watch it consistently top manga sales charts, or a movie releases and becomes the highest grossing anime movie ever made, and I really have to question that assertion. Are our standards this low that this derivative garbage can become a generation defining piece of media? You cannot expect the things you read or watch to be perfect. You cannot expect them to have no flaws. But for God's sake, people, have higher standards than this. Ultimately, I know that this video won't change anyone's mind. The people that agree with me will praise the accuracy of my arguments, while the people that don't will find any number of straw man arguments for why I'm unfit to criticize it at all. But here's the thing. At least when I watch something like Nisekoi, I can find enjoyment in laughing at how absurd it is. At least when I read One Piece, I can feel inspired and uplifted despite its flaws. But with Demon Slayer, despite the hyperbolic delivery of my criticisms throughout this video, I end up feeling nothing. I'm left feeling indifferent. And to me, inspiring indifference is even worse than inspiring hatred. Because at least when I hate something, I am feeling something. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate that. If you would do me the honor of pressing the like button if you like the video or leaving a comment, letting me know what you think, I would really appreciate that. I want to give a massive shout out to all of my patrons over at the Cats and Mac Patreon, especially my gamers, True and Lucy Raygear, and Small Game Dev, who joined after I filmed this. What an absolute gamer. And all of my simps, Victor Meza Roja, Ramu Nerd, Ninja Des, Skippy, Jimmy B, Degenerate, David D, Bill Nye the Bounty Guy, Belgara, and Marzak the Mad. They are all amazing, and I love them oh so much. Remember, Patreon is only five bucks a month and you get access to all kinds of behind the scenes and extra content, and it really helps me out, so maybe head on over if you want to. I'm gonna try really hard to make sure I get more than two videos out this year, and we're going strong already, we're only halfway through the year, and we already got two videos out. So, I'll see you guys in the next six months, hopefully. And if you have suggestions for things I can cover in the future, let me know in the comments, or just let me know what you thought in general. I appreciate it as always, you guys are the best. I love doing what I do. Thank you for 25,000 subscribers, by the way. What the heck? I'm just gonna skip right over that. What's wrong with me? That is a huge milestone that I did not ever think I would hit. I thank you so much. That is incredible. And I'm gonna keep working to make the best videos that I can for you guys. I can't wait to show you what I got up next. I've got all kinds of ideas in my head, but there's always room for more. So again, whatever suggestions you got, I'm always open to hearing them. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll see you within the next six months for sure. Maybe even more than once. I'll do my best. Also, I live stream here on YouTube, so join me then. You can see me a lot there, so. Love you. Bye.